let's begin. Thank you for joining me, Feminism, Comics and Humour, the 2000s. I focused on really on the first decade of the 2000s. A lot was happening and certainly since 2010 a lot more has happened and I offer a small snapshot. By this decade comics works by women in the UK were visibly and confidently entering the mainstream and what my snapshot will show is how the subject matter and means of production of women's comics engaged with feminist issues and strategies. Um, my main argument is that the increase in women's visibility is a result of structures put in place by feminism since the 70s, as my talks to date have hopefully demonstrated, particularly evident within publishing and within academia. Looking at the humour, I argue the humour changed to not necessarily produce belly laughter, but almost so something like a laughter through tears, which returns me to my starting point, because I theorise this by coming back to Hélène Sixou and Catherine Clement's idea of hellish pleasure, that the hysteric often laughs even as she howls. What they mean here is that when we experience trauma, our understanding of reality as we understand it is tested or questioned and seen in a new light as illusory or a construct. And by this, I'm interpreting reality as a social reality. In other words, a reality based on assumptions that we're raised with in order to make sense of the world, like all police are good or the governments have our best interests as their priority. So in understanding such reality as a mere construct, when we're put in a position of trauma, we're in a sense freed, liberated, and we can laugh through our pain. That's something like the idea that, as I understand it. And some of my individual case studies that I'm going to talk about uh, today are examples of this in relation to gender and feminism. To begin with some context of what was happening within feminist thought and activity at the beginning of this century, uh, let's have a look at feminism, the best sellers. So in, the, in America in 2005, feminist <coughs> Ariel Levy published Female Chauvinist Pigs, Women and the Rise of Raunch Culture. To explain what she meant by raunch culture, she included some of these as examples that there was a 700% increase in breast augmentations in the USA since 1992, that there was an increase of vaginoplasty or vaginal rejuvenation, which was cos is cosmetic surgery to alter a woman's labia and vulva to make the vagina more attractive. And there was an increase in beauty procedures such as Brazilian bikini waxes, where most of the woman's pubic hair is removed. So um, Ariel Levy's argument was that a younger generation of women were being encouraged to believe that through adopting this behavior, this raunch culture, through making themselves sex objects more than men were making themselves ob um, sex objects in this way, that there was a belief that they would become like men. And as a result, the idea being promoted was that through this process, through this adoption of raunch culture, women would achieve empowerment and liberation. And this, she argued, was being reinforced by popular culture that was saying this behavior was cool. Ariel Levy theorized an argument which continues from my discussion of the 1990s that the, these younger women were disillusioned by the women's liberation movement of the 70s, or what we refer to as second wave feminism, and that this was a rebellion from younger women. And the success, she argued, was a basis in economic consumption. And in the UK, Natasha Walter published Living Dolls, The Return of Sexism. And in this book, she changed her mind about her previous argument that she published in New Feminism in the 90s, in which she argued that feminism was dead, which I discussed last time as problematic in my 1990s talk. Now, 
um, Natasha Walter was saying that feminism was needed and she was echoing Ariel Levy's argument, but in a UK context. Based on her collection of women's personal stories, her argument here was that women were understanding and accepting a hypersexual objectification as an empowering form of feminism. And her ev evidence for this for, was, um, for example, from her interviews with young women who considered such activity as pole dancing and topless modeling as offering empowering choices for women. Secondly, she was in agreement with an argument put forward in the 90s by American feminist Susan, Susan Faludi in her bestseller Backlash. And Susan Faludi had argued that there was a rise in a belief in a biological determination for traditional sex roles. That is a belief in a rise in the belief that such things as genes and hormones decide our traditional sex roles. For example, women as biologically determined to reproduce and be positioned within the domestic. So this, uh, Faludi argued, was presented and reinforced through media and popular culture, particularly towards children. So, but although these publications are important, what they don't address is the economic and political context of the USA and the UK that was supporting the growth of neoliberalism in these decades. And this is relevant because for example, Natasha Walter doesn't consider the financial positions of the women that she interviewed who were working as sex workers, and she ignores the role of class in their decision making. Also, although she recognizes this and acknowledges it, Natasha Walter's research is limited to a heterosexual framework. And that means that debates around LGBT and transgender issues in this decade are not addressed in her theorizing. But perhaps most importantly, there's no consideration of the impact of globalization and technology on feminist activity. The internet provided new global platforms for significant and effective grassroots activity in this decade and protests that could be initiated by ordinary women and could start very easily from a voluntary position and lead to recognition and validation. And one example of this in the UK was the Policing and Crime Act in 2009, which reclassified the licensing laws for venues offering lap dancing, pole dancing or striptease as sexual entertainment venues rather than cafes or bars, which was the previous category. And this change in the law was achieved through collective campaigning by three feminist groups. The Fawcett Society, which was set up in 1866 and is Britain's leading charity campaigning for gender equality and women's rights. Object, uh, a feminist campaign group founded by Dr. Sasha Rakoff in 2004, in Britain to challenge the sexual objectification of women in the media and popular culture. And UK feminist, Feminista set up by feminist Kat Banyard in 2010. And this is just one example of how online based grassroots feminist activism was taking place. And um, this online grassroots activity was also evident in supporting comics activity in the UK particularly in publicizing events and publishing activity. There were three um, main developments that interested me in that took place in the UK and shaped the cultural position of comics during the, the first decade of this century and in turn positively impacted the position of women and I'll identify the links with feminist activity. So the graphic novel, the hand drawn in the digital age and a growing community. To start with the graphic novel, um, this was really the decade of the graphic novel becoming recognized as a form and introducing a new audience for comics in the UK. From 2004 to 2014, the value of the comic book and graphic novel market rose by almost 1000% and general bookshops began to expand their graphic novel sections. 
And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the graphic novel because it has been written about and discussed quite extensively. For anyone unfamiliar, the three graphic novels that really established the possibility of graphic novels or long form comics as a profitable option for publishers and as a form with a lot of different applications were Mouse, Persepolis and Fun Home. In the UK, Posey Simmons has continued to publish graphic novels and newspaper scripts, ensuring a wide audience for the form. And in 2001, when North American Chris Ware won the Guardian First Book Award with his autobiographical graphic novel, Jimmy Corrigan, this brought a new non-comics audience to the form, including women, including me, actually. Um, the main points about this new popularity of the graphic novel, which are relevant to my focus on women's comics and feminism, were that the graphic novel represented a different cultural space, positioning comics within literature rather than low art or popular culture. And for women, this was positive shift because women already had an established platform in the UK within literature, which was as a result of feminist activity within publishing, as I traced in my previous talks. Women did not have such a platform within comics. And also, the rise of the autobiographical subject matter was also significant for making women's comics works visible because it was memoir that feminist publishers had launched with from the 1970s onwards. So again, women already had an established platform within the sphere of autobiography as a result of feminism, not as a result of comics. Oh, product placement. My own graphic memoir, Billy, Me and You, published in 2011, was the first long form graphic memoir by a British woman to be published. And it's significant that to me, anyway, it was published by Myriad Editions Limited, an independent UK publisher directed by a woman, Candida Lacey, and creative editor, uh, Corinne Perlman, herself a cartoonist whose work has been included in many of the anthologies that I've referenced in my talks, and who la launched the graphic novel line at Myriad Editions, with my own work being the third one published, and now I think there are around 30 titles with Myriad. A second development with, within comics uh, in the UK was the rise in hand-drawn. So the internet ensured global communication, assisting marketing, distribution, and consumption of comics. But what it was increasingly supporting was a resurgence of low-tech, handmade, small press activity. And these grassroots, characteristic, grassroots characteristics are similar to the second and third wave feminist activity. And I'll show you some examples of activity that was including women both as organizers and creators. And there was a lot of work being produced by women now. And I, again, I've selected just a handful of anthologies as examples. Uh, so, um, 2002, Comics writer Selena Locke edited The Girly Comic, a comic strip anthology published by Factor Fiction, a small press that she co-ran with Jay Eels. It wasn't women-only comics, and I think this is interesting. Um, and the reason uh, Selena gave was because when she put a call out for submissions, most of them were from men, so her criteria changed to become every strip had to feature a female lead. And the series ran until 2011, including works by established cartoonists, including Lee Kennedy, Jeremy Dennis, also known as Jeremy Day, and Jenny Lynn Cole, as well as introducing works by younger artists, including Kate Brown, Asia Alfazi, Karen Rubens, Carrie Franzman, and Laura Howell. And uh, in 2012, uh, Selena and Jay uh, published a selection of the comic strips in a book. In 2003, cartoonist Jeremy Dennis, al already mentioned, also known as Jeremy Day, co-founded the Halls of Mensa Comics Anthology for Women Cartoonists <coughs> with cartoonists Sasha Mardu, Lucy Sweet, and later Ellen Lindner. 
They wanted to create an anthology of more in-depth women's works with fewer contributors. In 2011, Ellen Lindner took, Lindner took over editorship of the anthology under the new name, The Strumpet. And contributors to both versions of the anthology included Sally-Ann Hickman, Clean Lyons, Francesca Cassafetti, Patrice Ags, Sarah McIntyre, Creeper Joshi, Tanya Meditsky, Hannah Berry, Julia Scheel, Megan Kelso, and Sophia Niaxi. In Scotland, in 2009, Glasgow-based cartoonist Jill Hatcher founded Team Girl Comic, which was a collective of Scotland-based cartoonists that met to talk about comics and produce two comics anthologies a year of women's works. The social and community element was really important as an emphasis of this collective, as the aim was to showcase women and girls in, in um, alternative comic scene, as well as to entertain. Some of the anthologies were run as collective and like collectives and like Team Girl, there was an emphasis on community building. Activity was, that was social, not just production of publications. And this is the third area, the third development in the 2000s that I noticed um, rising. One example of event-based activity that started from feminism and incorporated comics and zines was the Lady Fest Festival. In 2000, the festival was first uh, started in America in Olympia, Washington, as a legacy of Riot Girl and DIY feminism. The first British Lady Fest Festival took place in 2001 in Glasgow and continued at different locations until 2012. In 2003, Bristol and Manchester curated the first British art exhibition of women comics makers entitled The Cave of Comics Queens, including established small press comics artists such as Lorna Miller, Lee Kennedy, Jeremy Dennis and Carol Swain. So you can hear that there are some recurring names. In 2003, Paul Gravette launched Comica with Peter Stanbury in London, hosting a series of events. In 2007, London-based creator Ollie Smith founded London Underground's Comics with a stall at Camden Lock Market and one day events running until 2009, working with other small press, press creators, Sean Azapardi, Phil Spence, Oliver Lambden, and Emma Price. And in 2008, London-based Jimmy Gherkin and Peter Lally set up alternative press organized events, including talks, workshops, poetry readings, and live drawings. So it wasn't just limited to comics. Um, just to say, uh, uh, London Underground Comics uh, joined together with Comica in 2008, and this was where I had a stall launching the first of Licorice, which was a zine I produced from 2008 to 11 um, with my then 12 year old daughter, Sally Plowman. And that it was in these uh, zine type magazines that I first published chapters of what later became Billy, Me and You. And it was in Licorice magazine that Corin Perlman saw the work. <clears throat> Perhaps the most well-known and most important comics initiative this decade was Thought Bubble Art Festival that continues today, set up in Leeds by cartoonist Lisa Wood, also known as Tula Lotte, after she'd finished her university degree and was working at the Leeds comic shop Travelling Man. It became the biggest festival of its kind in Britain, and it was unique because it celebrated not just traditional superhero comics, but also independent and small press. In 2009, the London Zine Symposium was set up by a collective initiated by uh, London-based artist and designer Ed Baldry, celebrating DIY culture, zines and comics. In spite of no association with a university for this event, it also included talks from academics, Professor Roger Sabin and Teal Triggs, whose research was into zines and alternative press. It was hosted at the Rag Factory, which introduced me to the Rag Factory as a venue for Ladies Do Comics. And the introduction of comics to academia was an important part of the community building at this time. 
and two significant events uh, in 2008 were organized in association with Paul Gravett's Comica. Um, and again, this is how I came to know about comics and the comics community was through this graphic novel activity. This is the first graphic novel event that I know of that took place in 2008 in February. And in November that year, there was a follow-up event uh, at the Victorian Albert Museum, a one-day event of talks. Um, there were also comics-based higher education courses uh, being set up around this time. There are now quite a few. The entrance of comics into the academy was important also because it was through academia that I came into comics and graphic novels, and it was through these events that I met uh, Sarah Lightman. Both of us were in the unique position of being practitioners as well as entering postgraduate academic study, both with an interest in gender, fine art and autobiography. And so it was in our friendship that we set up Ladies to Comics as a space for critical debate around the autobiographical comics works rather than the more mainstream superhero comics, as well as to address working in isolation which is demanded of longer form comics work. There were some other local comic reading groups in the UK, but the focus was more on mainstream superior or mainstream alternatives, such as the 2000 AD type comics, rather than works by women or more autobiographical works. The name Ladies Do Comics. So it can be interpreted as a nod to Lady Fest, which I already referenced, and Riot Girl, and unconsciously, this could have been a reference, but actually, uh, Sarah and I, at, well, I'm too old to have been part of Riot Girl, and it was actually intended as a more historical reference to Trina Robbins and the USA Women's Comics Collective, who had used girls in the 70s. We didn't see ourselves also as girls, or girls, or women, but we did like what they represented. So we put together a presence online to spread the word about our monthly physical meetings. Our position was everyone can make comics and this is echoed in the logo, which is memorable, low tech, easily copied. Um, the original drawing of Sarah and myself was a mockery really of ourselves as middle-aged posh white women. We didn't really at the time think anything beyond ourselves. We began, began in a very small way with a few of our friends. It wasn't women only, it was women led. By the end of the decade, we had audiences of around 100 people, including publishers, reviewers, as well as creators, transforming what we'd set up into a vibrant social networking activity with international branches spurred over the years. From the start, we hosted at a venue that reflected artistic practice rather than institution. The Rag Factory in London was perfect for this, which I've been introduced to, as I said, by the London Zine Symposium. We made our events free of charge to attend and welcoming to everybody. Um, Sarah's always baked cakes. I have to emphasize though that the landscape at this time in the UK was unrecognizable to what it is today in 2020. Even with COVID restrictions, there are events and activities and launches weekly. And this was not happening in 2009. There were festivals or sales-based activity, but there, wasn't a regu there weren't regular social events where women were in the majority of the audience. And we, we decided to be women-led, but not women only, and to host a friendly, welcoming atmosphere. But also to offer a platform that would be constructive in feedback as well as supportive and encouraging. We started with a book group model, but very quickly changed to inviting guest speakers, offering illustrated talks about their works. Guests who weren't necessarily comics creators, but have included filmmakers, animators, poets, artists, academics, with links, however, loosely to the comics form. We began combining established guests with those just starting out. Uh, Ladies Do Comics has grown organically. We're now a committee of six women. We're all creators and it is a voluntary uh, organization. 
since 2018, we have received some public funding through Arts Council England towards professional development activity surrounding our annual festival that's now recalibrating and moving online somewhat, such as through our online mentoring scheme that we're offering. The name change last year to LDC was a reflection on the limitations of the word ladies. Times have changed and we're keen to roll with the times. And here's a poster that, we, that will be on sale at the British Library as part of Unfinished Business, Women's Fight for Women's Rights exhibition. And this exhibition is part of a much wider uh, research pro project led by my PhD supervisor, Professor Margaret, Margareta Jolly. So the key points to note are that our influences are feminist. We work together at LDC as friends at social activity and well-being. We resist becoming an institution, yet we're keen now to partner with institutions. We're not a collective in the original um, meaning of the, of the word, but we're influenced certainly by the collective ideal and, and feel that each of our committee has a voice and input. Our meetings have characteristics certainly of the 1970s consciousness raising groups and we like to have that link. Our interest is in the subject matter first and how the comics form can disseminate important messages. Another important grassroots activity that's widened the comics community since the first decade, supported the feminist message and emerged like ladies that do comics from outside the comics industry is graphic medicine. Launched in 2007 by Ian Williams, who was a GP based in North Wales and then studied fine art at postgraduate level and completed a master's degree in medical humanities. He began a personal blog to record comics works he was coming across that conveyed the personal experience and emotions of patients and quickly drew a following, seeing the potential of the application of comics within healthcare. He organised the first graphic medicine conference in June 2010 at the University of London with financial support from the Wellcome Trust. Um, the conferences have become an annual event and a committee was established with partners from North American universities, including MK Serwiak, who also led the Chicago branch of LDC for a while. In 2015, Graphic Medicine established a line of publications in association with Penn State Press. Um, and also Ian has published two graphic novels since then with Myriad Editions. What's been really unique about these conferences and indeed the audience is the in, in dis, interdisciplinary mix of, to quote the strap line, exploring the interaction between the medium of comics and the discourse of healthcare. It brings together a community of academics, health professionals and comics creators. Um, from my role within LDC and my association also with graphic medicine, I became aware of women making particular types of graphic memoir, often around trauma and surprisingly often including a humour that informed my selection of individual case studies for my research. Um, I also selected my case studies, my individual case studies, because of similarities in their production process or the path which I'll highlight as I talk about them to show the links with feminist activity in subject matter and or means of production. And starting with uh, Simone Lear, British born Maltese illustrator, who currently draws a delightful weekly comic strip for the Observer newspaper, which uh, for when anyone beyond the UK is the British national Sunday edition of the Guardian newspaper. And I've chosen one to read out because it's topical to the pandemic, but also because it's a gentle critique of capitalism. So it's, we have two squirrels and the title is The Human Disease. Why do we run from humans, Daddy? Because they're carriers of contagious virus. What is it? It's the I want disease. What's that? It's an illness that makes them unsatisfied and always in want of more. I want, I want, they cry. They don't appreciate what they already have. See that one? 
He's not happy with his human ears and has covered them up with plastic blockers. <gasps> Can he hear the birds sing? Not even the seagulls. Some are fed up with their noses and mouths and are decorating them with fabric. Most of them only use their eyes to look at their portable rectangles. Daddy, that's a clever phone. Uncle Mike's got one. He uses it to find the nuts he's buried. What do you mean? There's an app on it called Find My Nuts. It helps him locate buried nuts. He doesn't lose them anymore. The squirrel thinks, then says, I want a clever phone. Daddy, I think you've got the virus. And this is a good introduction to Simone's humour, which relies on incongruity, making us laugh, but also inviting us to reflect on more profound questions. Uh, Simone's authored a range of award-winning books. Her second graphic novel, Please God Find Me a Husband, and two children's books. Her first graphic novel was Fluffy, published as a book in 2005, which I'll be talking a bit more about. But what I want to first outline is Simone's path to publication, because I argue it offers insight into the times and opportunities for women. My interest is her means of production, style and subject matter. And my interpretation is that this combination reflects feminist issues and approaches, though not necessarily consciously. In 1995, Simone completed a BA in illustration as a first generation university student. In 2000, she studied for a master's in illustration at the Royal College of Art London, one of the most distinguished art and design postgraduate colleges in the world. Her focus was children's book illustration, but while she was there, she was introduced to comics by fellow student Tom Gould, who also cartoons currently for The Guardian. Simone and Tom collaborated publishing first to include both their comics works. They photocopied and distributed it themselves, set up Cabanon Press in 2000 to self-publish their works and published second. They were approached by Bloomsbury who published first and second together as both. Between 2003 and 2005, Simone produced <coughs> four volumes of Fluffy published as a graphic novel in 2005. The points I find uh, relevant to note are that Simone was highly educated to postgraduate level at one of the top art schools in the world. As a first generation university student, this shows how opportunities were becoming more available. She used grassroots strategies which echoed the small press route and the autobiographical but what distinguished her and Tom's work was this evidence of design training. Uh, you can see it in their works, a knowledge of paper stock, a knowledge of colour and printing. By 2003 also, there were a number of comic shops in London where they could sell small press. I want to talk about Fluffy to explain why I think the subject matter is feminist. Fluffy is the story of a baby rabbit that insists that a single man, Michael Pulcino, is its father or daddy. The incongruity is at the heart of the humour. Fluffy, I'm not your real daddy. Yes, you are, daddy. No, I'm a man and you're a bunny. The bunny pauses to think. I'm not a bunny. And also, um, I was thinking my interpretation, uh, the incongruity of the subject matter is also a comment on parenting. And what do I mean by that? So by Michael Pulcino saying he's not the father, he can't be because he's a man and Fluffy is a rabbit, I question, is the comment actually implying he can't be the father because he's a single man? And it made me think about the incongruity within a Western context because the single man as parent protagonist um, is still something of anomaly, an anomaly and we still tend to assume that single parents are women, just a thought. And this is why I think it offers a gentle feminist critique of parenting. The incongruity of the humor makes us, the reader, switch between reality and fantasy. How does this work? The speaking rabbit presents Fluffy as human, as a human toddler, the pestering and persistence of the child's behavior but, is and, and my work was illustration but it was all, always quite cartoony this was an example so of my work sort of scene of chaos daddy i'm a tractor i'm a princess we don't concern ourselves with the dull realities of childcare, 
and nor do we concern ourselves with the speaking rabbit. Yet at the same time, the demands of a toddler are presented in all their overwhelming reality as we see him lay his head on his desk in despair in the final panel. The trope of anthropomorphic animals is common in children's picture books, but this is not a typical children's book. Simone's style doesn't include traditional bright colors of children's picture books and the sophistication in the humor is directed at adults. And I wanted to talk briefly about humor and the cute because another characteristic that reinforces the incongruity and adds humor is the cute, the baby cute of the rabbit, the cuteness of the small fluffy thing. There's a nod to the cute of iconic Japanese cartoon characters such as Hello Kitty and the Pokemon character Pikachu, popular in 1980s rave culture. And journalist Carrie O'Grady explains the Japanese term kawaii as infinitely precious just for managing to exist so bravely and perkily despite being so small and vulnerable in a cruel world a left field brand of alterno cuteness. But Simone's drawing style doesn't really rely on the large eyes and small mouth trope of the Japanese characters, more closely aligning herself with the lean Claire, Claire tradition used by Hergé for Tintin and his cute companion dog Snowy. So what do those terms alterno cuteness or vulnerable yet brave mean? I looked at the writing of Sean Guy, our aesthetic category, zany, cute, interesting. And she writes about cute as an aesthetic that creates, she writes, a desire in us, not just to lovingly molest, but also to aggressively protect them. And she draws attention to the language that we might use when we meet a small puppy or baby. So cute, I could eat it or I could hug them to death. So actually, she points out the combination of violence or aggression with cute, this love-hate relationship, sickly sweet. And Sean Nagai links this cute aesthetic to capitalism. She talks about how our desire is for intimacy, but to fulfill that desire, we buy the cute. We purchase it, consume it, the cute media, including comic books. Cuteness, she argues, is the commodification of everything, by which she means the hyper-commodified, information-saturated, performance-driven conditions of late capitalism. In my next study of an individual, I looked at Katie Green. Her book, Lighter Than My Shadow, published in 2013, is her autobiographical story of living with anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa as her child's body becomes adult and the experience she, um, the experience of, se of sexual abuse from her therapist. Like Simone Lear, Katie Green was trained at higher education level with a BA in sequential illustration at Swindon College School of Art. Like Simone, she used small press production as a strategy and community. Uh, Katie kept an active blog generating a loyal following and self-published her bi-monthly zine, Green Bean, from 2010 to 13. Like Simone, Katie's attention to choice of paper stock and printing indicates a trained sense of design. In her style, there's a visual incongruity. The front cover uses the clean, simplified line of children's book illustration in which she includes also the baby cute innocence of girlhood, shown in the wide-eyed, worried dots for eyes and small line mouth. Like Simone, Kate acknowledges the lean Claire tradition of bon désigné. But this is contradicted by the scribbled cloud of black line the girl's looking at to her right. This metaphorical feature continues throughout Katie's book, the messy scribbled mark representing the dark, untidy tangle of her life experience. And it effectively shows us, the reader, with immediacy, her changing mental and emotional condition. American feminist philosopher Susan Bordeaux writes that the ideal of beauty is one of the most powerful ideologies that influences gendered behavior today. It's an ideal that includes thinness as aesthetically pleasing, according to gender studies scholar Michelle N. Huang. 
This book is high production publication combined with Katie's illustration style. It is very beautiful to look at. It is aesthetically pleasing. It is also a big book, hardback of 500 pages. And this physical materiality of Katie's book reminds us of the value placed on material goods and wealth as an aspect of Western capitalism, the emphasis upon outward appearances. It gives weight, its weight gives its value. And yet the story is about a young girl's quest to lessen her weight, to symbolically reduce the somatic space she takes up, to reduce her power, to devalue herself. But an alternative interpretation of the anorexic thinness offered for board, by Bordeaux is that it stands for an increase in power. She says, through a disidentification with the maternal body, the anorexic is offered a symbolic freedom from a reproductive destiny. And Katie visualizes this in her desire to cut the hips, the stomach and breasts of womanhood. Canadian environmental studies scholar Mara Hurd notes, one of the central projects of feminism has been the association between women and maternity. And to continue in this sphere, my next case study is Paula Knight. Published in 2013, Paula Knight's book is about her experience of conception and miscarriage. If we interpret Katie Green's work as symbolizing a lack of freedom from her fertility, in contrast, we may interpret Paula Knight's work as symbolizing a lack of freedom from her infertility or frustrated quest for mother motherhood. In common with Katie, it's subject matter based on reproductive destiny. Sharing characteristics in her process to Katie and Simone, Paula is trained at higher education level and with a background in children's book illustration. Paula also engaged with the small press production strategy and community. She self-published zines of her story and spoke about her work at Ladies to Comics and at graphic medicine conferences. <clears throat> she draws herself here bent over with hands on the floor, suggestive perhaps of early stages of labor. So we can read the red handwriting as symbolic of the blood of miscarriage, visual failure in pursuit of pregnancy, with the language showing us the contradictory cultural comment of childless versus child free. The use of labels signifies a scientific or medicalization of the process which determines Paula's cultural status. And in my interpretation of the red writing, I reference French Michel uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault's medical gaze or the red tape of his concept of biopower developed in his history of sexuality. Biopower describes disease and reproduction as part of an economic process, which means that these aspects of life become part of political and social control of the individual and the population. And we can see how this happened by looking at a history of women in Western medicine. Basically, before the 18th century in England, healthcare was about uh, relieving the pain of dying through herbal mixtures and existed in a domestic sphere dominated by women. But in the 18th century, an economic potential was recognized in the potions as remedies that could be packaged and sold in the marketplace. Uh, bringing the domestic into the public meant women lost control. At the same time, medicine was being introduced as a science and a focus of study. In this way, medicine became professionalized, which reinforced the economic market. And this, these changes excluded women because women weren't allowed to study medicine, study. So medicine developed as an exclusively male profession, plus the marketplace was male dominated. And then childbirth, childbirth became included as part of medicine, which meant childbirth also became exclusively male, where before it had been absolutely taboo for men to be involved in childbirth at all. At the end of the 19th century, medicine and health was understood as illness, as a state of disease with a focus on the cause and effect. 
But during the 20th century, what uh, David Armstrong refers to as surveillance medicine took place, this shift that meant the word illness was replaced by health and understood as a risk or a prevention of disease. And that, how this narrative worked was to say that health was the personal responsibility of the individual. So for example, we hear about the promotion of healthy lifestyles is an example of a Foucauldian mechanism that contributes to biopower. It is the individual's responsibility to be healthy and therefore the individual's fault if they are not healthy. And what Foucault argued was this power to regulate health is also the power to regulate and define what is normal or abnormal. So if we think about the language used around maternity as natural, to be healthy becomes associated with fertility and reproduction, while to be infertile becomes positioned as failure, the responsibility or fault of the individual woman. And Paula Knight visually addresses the idea of individual failure. Fallopian tubes also suggest a stethoscope, symbolic of the medical system judging her. The large blue hand pointing down at her calls to mind Michelangelo's fresco painting on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, The Creation of Adam, an illustration of God breathing life into Adam from the book of Genesis in the Bible is an image that be has become iconic of humanity. In Paula's image, the implication then is God has failed, but the dunce hat shifts the responsibility onto her as, a, as an individual. Instead of fertility being something over which she has no control, it's her fault. The narrative is a tragic comedy as Paula uses humour to draw attention to how language around miscarriage reinforces the blame of the individual. I didn't, so it's lost versus loss. I didn't lose this. My body rejected this, but it felt like I'd lost this. If I'd lost a baby, we see her saying, where'd I put it? It would imply carelessness. She says, shit, I just can't find it. And it would all be my fault. It's gone and I'm to blame, she says. Uh, so she clearly shows how if the desired pregnancy does not ensue, the failure or fault becomes that of the individual woman. Still within the complex feminist sphere of reproductive destiny and similarly addressing issues of individual choice and personal doubt, I looked next at Sarah Lightman's work. Sarah started her autobiographical project, The Book of Sarah, in 1995, named after the silenced biblical matriarch. In 2019, published as a graphic memoir, Sarah's work reflects her personal contradictions in combining her beliefs in traditional Orthodox Judaism, which are reinforced and even imposed by her family, and her intellectual feminist beliefs developed as she moves through higher education to postgraduate level. Her links to the work of Katie and Paula are in her decision to try and get pregnant. There's also a similarity in her publication route. Though Sarah's engagement was in comics community building rather than small press publication, co-founding Ladies Do Comics with me in a quest to inject the art school crit to community from her background in fine art. Sarah trained at postgraduate level in fine art at Slade School of Art, University College London, another of the most prestigious art schools in the world. Sarah's training as fine artist is reflected in her challenge to what the comics form can be. The laborious pencil work is defiantly artwork, not comic, produced for gallery rather than reproduction. The handwritten pencil text is added to the page, adding poignancy to the static and photographic-like images. But the faintness of pencil in the writing as opposed to pen hints at her lack of confidence in expressing her contradictory feelings. The pencil, after all, can be rubbed out, amended. The production, the decision to produce digital font for the book publication <coughs> arguably, arguably diminishes this aspect of her work, rendering the line of her text as uniform. 
in Thoughts of Motherhood by an uncertain 35-year-old. The uncertain in the title indicates what Adrian Riche described as the suffering of ambivalence, the murderous alternation between bitter resent resentment and raw-edged nerves and blissful gratification and tenderness. Riche was referring to the ambivalence of motherhood but already a commitment to motherhood and its accompanying emotional hellish pleasure has begun for Sarah in her decision to try and get pregnant. Her literal visualization of eggs signifies the woman's egg in the process of conception and the fixed number of eggs produced by a woman. It's a humorous play on the word egg. One egg sits next to a half full egg box suggesting visually a reading as a contraceptive diaphragm a reminder of the tensions between science and feminism. The use of shop-bought egg box of eggs also signifies the Western context, the medicalization of reproduction. We buy a packet of eggs and technology promise us the purchase of fertility on demand, but it's a promise that cannot be guaranteed. Her text reflects this, how long have I got? Is it my choice anymore? Was it ever? The was it ever recognizes the control of choices imposed through consumption and commercialization within society as experienced by Paula, <coughs> but also pressures on her choice from her family and religion and the expectations for women to reproduce. The text reflects the parental pressure. My dad says I shouldn't leave things too late. My mum asked if I was having doubts. Her text reflects her lack of freedom. I was excited to see my friends this week, but there is no escape. One friend, unprompted, told me of her two-year struggle to have a child. Another told me she, uses, she was freezing her eggs to wait for her Mr. Right. She continues. Um, but what... I can hear someone's thing up. But when I talked all this through with you in your calm way, you said we weren't rushing yet. I'm trying to focus on self-love. That doesn't revolve around food, but I keep being drawn back to baking for other people. The humor is in implicit reference to bun in the oven as an idiom for pregnant. And the suggestion that in baking the bun for others, her pregnancy is also for others, not herself. I must be filling a cake shape, shaped hole in my life. My need to feed might just be thwarted maternal instinct back to that egg thing. As with Katie Green's work, there's a troubled relationship with food <coughs> and a link with food and maternity. Sarah's, wo Sarah's work is about her relationship to Judaism. And in answer to believers' claims that religion should be treated with due respect, Sheila Jeffries writes that disrespect for religion is key for feminism. Disrespect for it should be the natural amniotic fluid of feminist thought and action. And in this, she echoes Mary Daly, Beyond God the Father from the 1970s, where she argued that religion is a tool of patriarchy. But in Sarah's interpretation of her belief, she finds a space where <coughs> religion and spirituality can coincide by selecting practices from the more progressive reform Judaism, breaking with her family's orthodox customs. And we can see a parallel in Islamic religious practice as identified by scholar, Norwegian scholar Lisbeth Mikkelsen, who distinguishes between Muslim feminism, which advocates the emancipation of women, and Islamist feminism advocating a patriarchal approach to women's roles, that women should not aim to be equal to men, but should instead accentu accentuate their integrity and dignity as women. This is pertinent to the 2000s in Britain as a time and place of multiculturalism and a population including second, third, and even fourth generation immigrants. In 2010, um, Nahid Afroz Kabir writes about how identity is about difference as well as a sense of shared belonging. 
and how Muslims in Britain are ethnically diverse and the only elements they have in common is their religion. As I've shown in my talks and comics, comics and cartoons can be used to address intersectionality. It seems to be a form that offers a potential for addressing the complexities surrounding debates around what it means to be British and what it means to be feminist. And one example of how this has been done in relation to Muslim identity is the work of Al Asia Al-Fazi. Um, Birmingham-based manga artist Asia Al-Fazi was born in Libya in 1984 and moved with her family to Glasgow, Scotland in 1993 when she was eight. At 19, she was living in Birmingham and won a drawing competition with her developing manga style. She was the youngest entrant and the only girl. In 2007, she won the International Anime Manga Festival with her drawing, making her comics work visible. Often comics artists recycle the same manga characters, but instead of referencing Japan and Japanese characters that already existed, Asya created new characters to communicate from her own culture. That hadn't been done before, and it was this that set her work apart in the comics world. In her 2006 strip, hijab strip, uh, that Asya posted online, she uses humour to show the everyday assumptions and misconceptions about Muslim women. <clears throat> the protagonist, a teenage girl, invites a white girl into her bedroom. Here we go. Welcome to my room. Whoa, nice posters. I didn't think you'd be such a Bruce Lee fan. Ha, <laughs> why not? He's a brilliant martial artist. Can I have a look at your wardrobe? Sure, make yourself at home. As she removes her hijab, we see she has dyed blue hair. There's no textual reference to it, relying on a sophisticated use of the visual to challenge the reader as much as the friend and create humor through the unexpected. Ooh, you have pretty clothes. Whose dress is this? Mine. The ignorance or latent racism is conveyed in the friend's comment, you're not wearing your scarf thing. I'm sorry, not to be rude or anything. It's just that I've only ever seen you wear things that totally cover you up. Ha ah, yeah, I know. It's all cool when there's no geyser around. No one would believe I had a Pikachu nighty and take part in karate tournaments either. Really? In one page, Azia uses the strip to confront assumptions around Muslim dress and interest. Azia is university educated and her work presents a liberal religious voice. She's not restricted in any way in her everyday life. She's familiar with British cultural language, having grown up in Britain. It's the nuances of living as a woman with a pluralistic identity that's presented to the reader through the humour, challenging the reader's assumptions about difference. In doing so, Alpha, uh, Asia's comics represent a form of media within popular culture that contests the dominant media discourse, which often demonises Muslims. Um, inspired by Marjan Satrapi's work, Persepolis, to produce a similar heartfelt work about Libya, um, in 2007, she signed a contract with publisher Bloomsbury to produce a two-part semi-autobiographical graphic novel with the first part set in Libya during the 70s and 80s and the second part set in Glasgow, where she grew up. The purpose was to show two entirely different cultures from an insider's perspective. Her project has really grown since then, and, I, and she spent some time in Libya towards her research. She continues to produce graphic novel, narratives towards this. So coming to my conclusions, uh, this, this first part of the new century um, showed a professionalism in the works that were being made that belies the DIY associations. Also, uh, much more evidence of higher education of authors and a variety of styles from illustration to fine art, challenging and pushing what comics form can be in style and the subject matter. 
and also to show that the community was building that incorporates feminist strategies based on and reinforcing social networks. Thank you very much.